What? We're already halfway through the year? My god, well, let's go ahead and look at some of the good and maybe not so good of the year thus far. Hey, what's up, bookworms? Mike back with kind of a mid-year check-in here. Kind of can look at the what's going right, what's going wrong so far this year when it comes to reading and all things channel-related. We're going to kind of dip into all of it, and I'm very excited to do so, even if I cannot believe that we're already halfway through the year of 2024. So let's begin, like usual, talk about what I've read so far. Well, so far, 32 books. And, I mean, books is the word I use lightly. 27 of them have been novels. Four have been manga volumes, one is a short story collection, and one was actually a DNF. But I do want to say I want to count all these here as far as books go. I count things like manga volumes and stuff like that. In the end, to me, I'm not one of those who's like, I got to get 100 books in a year. No, not so much. But uh, that is a kind of a, a sharp reflection if you compare it to last year, where I feel like I was reading five, six, maybe sometimes seven to eight books a month. I'm down to a good four and maybe five if it's just a manga or something like that. So that's kind of a, the... The comfort zone I found myself in lately, and I'm I'm feeling pretty good about it. How about some of the most read authors up to this point? Now I am mixing it up much more this year than previous years. My coffee's about to fall off my desk here, and so I think that it's going to be. Not, it's usually I'll have like one or two authors have like twelve or thirteen on here at this point. Well, I'm not doing very many series this year, so that hasn't happened yet. But first, we got Michael McDowell, uh, six volumes of the Blackwater Saga. So. He's leading the pack. Peter McLean is actually coming in second. As I did read the entire War for the Rose Throne this year. That's four books. Uh, Ishiro Oda of uh, One Piece fame, obviously. Also four. I've read four volumes in Skype so far. We'll be continuing with that. He'll probably have the most at the end of the year. And then, of course, I uh, had several with two. Uh, Larry Correa, Zach Argyle, Stephen King all had two a piece. And then, of course, a lot of new authors that I've checked out this year and only gotten one book in thus far. So I feel like I am spreading the love a little bit more this year. And I think that my reading plans have been better for it. Now, usually I do a top 10 books so far. I'm going to reduce it down to five this year because, like I said, I have read a little less than I have in previous years. So let's do my top five books so far that I've read in 2024. Now, these are not ranked or anything like that. I will wait and do that with the end of the year. Right now, I don't feel like I could actually pick a winner because it is really that close. So let's kind of talk about each one a little bit. First up is Shogun by James Cavell, a book that I did spread out over three months, and I'm glad that I did it that way because it was a monster of a book. However, fantastic. It was just a wonderful read, an incredible journey, and reading it right before the new FX adaptation came out was just phenomenal. I would recommend everybody do it that way if you can. Read the book and then immediately watch the FX adaptation if you have not yet. Just a stunning, stunning book. Never seen the use of Stranger in Strange Land done better. It really is just a magnificent story and it's just so many things that I enjoyed more because I watched the 1980 miniseries first, but so many things I enjoyed about it more than that miniseries because the miniseries was very much just from Black Shin, uh, Blackstone, Anjan's point of view. I want to call him Black Jin there. Uh, Anjan, uh, Blackstone, his, his uh, character, it was just kind of from his point of view, you really didn't understand any of the intent of the Japanese character. So with this version being more like the book, obviously with the book you get both sides of this and you understand what Yabu was thinking, you understand what Lord Tornag was thinking, you understand what Mariko was thinking about Blackstein. It made much more sense. And just basically when I was reading the book, I was like, wow, this is like reading the director's cut. But again, the adaptation that they just recently did was closer to the book. In fact, 95% of that show, not in English. So uh, make sure you're paying attention if you are watching. But as far as the book, it's just, it's it's everything that you've heard of this. It's one of those that had just unreal expectations when I started it. And not only did it meet it, guys, it, 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 it over exceeded them. It was really just an amazing journey. And I'm glad that I did finally make it. It's up there with the Pillars of the Earth as like my favorite historical fiction book ever. It really is that close. And I do recommend it to all walks of life. I mentioned Blackwater by Michael McDowell. This was a ride, guys. I the fact that he takes over, you know, multiple generations over 50 years with the Kasky family here and he takes them from, you know, just where you just would not expect it to go really because this is a family that is in the the south. It's a very rich, but obviously they're dealing with uh, lots of, of different things and things that can kind of go up or downward for the family. 
And seeing this, you've got, uh, at the reader, we know there is obviously a creepy crawly kind of in the story. It is, it is listed as a horror, horror story, but to me it's very much a uh, slice of life kind of, uh, not really, it's got, it's got coming of age, and it's got a little bit of everything, but it's very much a family drama, but with a little bit of the supernatural. So very much Southern Gothic, if you are something you're into, like A Boy's Life by a, uh, a Robert McCammon. I think that you would really, really dig this. It's just an interesting way of spending time with these characters. And after a while, you're asking yourself, you know, what is the plot here? You don't care. You're just enjoying spending time with this family and getting to know all these different workings. And it's amazing that you can go through generations of this family and their kids, and then their kids grow up, and their kids, and their kids grow up. It's really just, uh, it, you never find yourself being confused at who anyone is because he's just an amazing character writer. This is the guy that wrote the screenplay for Beetlejuice, I learned, by the way. Excellent, excellent writer. And I'll definitely be visiting more Michael McDowell. So right now I feel like Shogun or Blackwater would be like my 1A, 1B for Book of the Year. I couldn't make a decision right now, but they are leading the pack. I'm not saying that they're untouchable, but right now it seems like uh, uh, each year, I feel, it feels like in March or April, I'm like, okay, I feel like I've already read my Book of the Year. And with those two, reading them pretty close at the same time, uh, really has been like, wow, this is going to be a slugfest down to the end. But yeah, Blackwater uh, is just an amazing, amazing story. And I, I would I would challenge you to to read it and not get something out of it. Because I feel like going through all these different generations, these families, there's going to be something that everyone will really latch on to. And it's, it's just terrific. Streets of Laredo by Larry McMurtry. Now, you guys know Lonesome Dove was my book of the year last year. So I said I did want to continue. When you talk about Lonesome Dove, you're talking about one of the best books ever. I mean, usually with me, I say legacy takes time. And Lonesome Dove made my top 10 books of all time, like immediately. Didn't even have to wait. And that's one of those I said, I know it's going to be higher on this list after time goes by. So you want to talk about the most unreal expectations ever. You're talking about the sequel to Lonesome Dove. And I'll be damned if he didn't pull it off. Now, I didn't like it as much as Lonesome Dove because that's just like impossible. But you're talking about a five-star book and like a 4.85. <laughs> it really is just that damn good. And uh, it's it's one of those things where you thought, okay, well, you know, some of these characters, uh, you know, that I loved in the first book, they are kind of around in this one. Is it going to kind of be the same? Uh, this guy is the master of character work. I mean, I have struggled to find anyone maybe Stephen King that's done it as good as Larry. I've only read two Larry McMurtry books, but they've both been all-timers. I think this guy is just the absolute pinnacle of what I want out of the way that characters are written on the page. He's just amazing at what he's able to do. And another one of those where you're like, okay, I this one I feel like this one had like a little bit more of a plot than a lot of the moment a lot of the time in Lonesome Dub because you did have a goal in this one whereas you know you had your trail ride or whatever it was about the journey I think not the destination in Lonesome Dub this one is very much about the destination but the journey isn't bad either and the character relationships that develop and I will say right off the bat no matter how much grim dark fantasy you guys have been reading. Larry McMurtry is darker because it's dealing with real history and it's dealing with the you know, American Westward expansion, which the hardest thing to do during that time period was stay alive. And yeah, it is grim. I mean, it is dark. There's some things I'm just like, oh my Lord. But he just fascinates you. Like he'll give you this character that just showed up and he'll give you this backstory that's like 30 pages long and you're just absolutely riveted. You can't get enough of it. So I was like, oh, I don't care about this Maria character. Yeah, I do. I do care about this Maria character. So uh, great. And what he did in Treats Laredo with his villains, man, his villains were just, oh, it was, it was, I, he made, uh, what uh, uh, Joey made, made Blue Duck from Lone Stuff actually seemed kind of likable. That's how messed up Joey was and Mox Mox. Really, really great stuff. So yeah, incredible follow-up. I cannot wait to read the prequels. Because there are two prequels, and I get to see uh, Young Gus and Call again. That should be very exciting. But, man, it's just, I can't believe what this guy is able to do. There's a chapter in this where Call is just sharpening things, and I couldn't get enough of it. He's just hes just a wizard, man, just like Stephen King. And i got to put You Like It Darker on here. Now, this was a short story collection, so usually I wouldn't really count something like this, but it was just too good. I mean, it was my book of the month when it came out, and I just had a blast with it. It felt like a throwback to old-school Stephen King, where he's like, okay, I think that's what the title and it kind of dictates here. You like it darker. You're like, he's heard that everybody's about sick of Holly. They're about sick of him doing the crime detective stuff. They want him to get back to a little bit of things that go, you know, make you get scared at nighttime, I think. A little bump in the night is what I was trying to say. I don't know. Sometimes I forget what I'm going to say. It just happens when you get in the 40s. But uh, yeah, it was very good. And I think that some of the short stories in here are like all timers or some of the best short stories you read. I, I compared this to saying that it was the best short story collection of his since Nightmares and Dreamscapes back in the 90s. And I love that collection. 
So yeah, just the King still every once in a while, man, he got, he, got, he comes out and he still has his fastball, and it just it just blows me away what he's able to do. Now some of these were rather old, you know, and he's just done some uh, some touch ups on them, but it doesn't matter. They're still really great stuff. And if you'd have told me at this point in life that Stephen King would still be putting out new material and it would still be good, I'm not sure I would have believed you because most authors his age they've entered kind of paycheck stage at this point. But uh, he, this one this was a big big hit for me, and it got me very excited for what non-holly books do come next and uh fifth here i guess i would have to say son of the black sword by larry correa now this is book one the saga of the forgotten warrior and what makes this series kind of unique to me is he's found a way to not sacrifice world building but actually make his books much more fast-paced than a lot of epic adult fantasy that i read these days he's not spending tons and tons and tons of time just building his world he's working on his characters and he somehow found this secret formula to make an epic fantasy book almost rip at the pace of a thriller so i i don't really want to compare it too much to red rising because red rising i feel like is non-stop action but i can see that people that like red rising are going to like this series because it is very very fast paced you really grow to like the characters over time and uh, just this world he set up is brilliant he's not spending pages and pages and pages talking about the landscaping he's not talking about as he put it george i'm not talking about you know their tax policy uh he's he's interested in moving this world forward to feel bigger to you without dragging you down with history lessons and i think that's just a really nice touch now i liked book one better than book two but i'm starting book three here very very soon and i'm excited to continue because this series is very good but i'd have to say uh, son of the black sword was probably my favorite. And it was hard when you're reading a series. Uh, one that just missed it, guys. I, I didn't know which one to pick. I liked all four of the War for the Rose Throne books, so I don't know which one to put on there. But I think Priest of Bones was the one that really grabbed my attention, obviously, it being the first one. It would have been close on here. So how about some of those disappointing, I like to call them. Now, again, I like to say this, guys. These aren't bad books. I'm not calling them bad books. They're books that maybe I had some expectations for and it didn't quite hit them. So I want to make sure that I get that out front here. The Vanished Bird, Simon Jimenez, that's my one DNF this year. If you guys have been following the channel for a while, you know I do not DNF books very often. I think it's the third one since I started this channel. Now, I've shelved some books and went back to them later, so I don't count those. But this is the one where I'm like, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to finish this, nor do I care to. I've talked about it at length on the channel at this point. I uh, had a full hour-long conversation with the guys at the Quilluminati about it. So if you guys want to know more about what didn't work for me, I think you can find it there. But uh, yeah, Vanished Birds was a big miss for me. I know a lot of people love it, and that's cool. Uh, I'm not taking that away. If you guys love it, that's awesome. It just was a big miss for me, as was The Toll by Neil Schusterman. That's a book three in The Ark of a Scythe, which is just unfortunate because the first book... Uh, just Scythe was just so damn good, so good. It was like it was almost like a modern age, uh, The Giver. It really was just that really good, and it just the sequel was like, it was fine. It, 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 it kind of expanded on it. It added some new characters. I wasn't sure why we were focusing so much time on them. Why aren't you giving me my two main characters from the first book? And then the third book just completely off the rails. And unlike Vanished Birds, I don't think anyone. <laughs> I haven't found very many people who like the toll very much. And this is one of those where I say I am stubborn about DNFing books because I knew 100 pages in, oh no, and this was a beefy book and I made myself finish it. And it was just one of those where I was just face palming the whole time that I was reading it. That right now would probably be the lead for our most disappointing books of the year. And I didn't even DNF it. I think that's what made it more disappointing. And again, books one and two were pretty good. One was excellent, you know? So yeah, yeah, very disappointing. Uh, this one might upset some people. And I hate to do this to the turtles because you guys warned me not to start with The Color of Magic by Terry Pratchett. Book one in Discworld. But yeah, it was, it was as advertised. It was very confusing. Wasn't quite sure what was going on. It shifted narrative focus so many times that I wasn't really sure what was happening. Uh, the way I put it was like your drunk uncle is at a family reunion, uh, just basically giving you a rundown satire of this fantasy book he used to like when he was a kid. That's kind of what it felt like. And I know that's probably what he was going for. And I've heard that the first few books like that in the Discworld are like that. So uh, again, I'm not going to decide not to continue Discworld because of that. But uh, yeah, it was it was pretty much what you guys told me it was going to be. And I knew that. I knew that going in. What I said was I got five books from a patron for Discworld. Those are the five that I'm going to read. So yeah, I'm going to be reading Light Fantastic too before I get on to Guards, Guards, or Mort's, or Equal Rights. I know that's where most of you guys told me to start. It's one of those three. But I will be getting there. 
And it will be continuing with it. But yeah, I did say I had all these warnings going into it, and I still thought, well, it can't be this bad. Now I'm going to go to it with lowered expectations. It can't, you know, it, it did. It was, it was, it was pretty forgettable. As was Wool by Hugh Howie, and that's very disappointing to me because I love the Silo uh, Apple TV series, and I thought that the book would be pretty good as well. And again, the book wasn't bad, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't let down a little bit. Now I give this one kind of a pass, somewhat because it is an omnibus. It is several short stories that they just kind of crammed together to make a novel, but it's 600 pages of nothing but just like character changing and just the narrative just changes in focus so much. It's like every time I start to get really interested in one character, he shifts to someone else. And then it's just like so fast, so fast. You you don't spend enough time long enough with each character to get invested with what's going on in the story. And that's again, where I said you can tell it was very much just pieced together from several different stories. So I feel like if this had had like a rewrite, I, I think he could have done it better. I feel like that's what the show is doing, is it's writing it kind of in sequential order, taking its time to breathe a little bit and showing some of those other things. But the way that it ended, I was just kind of like, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it's cool that I got season two of Silo now, you know, but it was also just like, I, I, I liked it enough to continue with the series, but I'm not anxious to continue with the series, which is exactly what I said about the last book here, which is The Demon Awakens by R.A. Salvatore. Now, this one, again, this wasn't a bad book, but man, was I let down big time because this was the one, like it's like New Fantasy World, I was most excited to start. I was excited to see what R.A. Salvatore could do when he stepped outside of Dungeons and & Dragons and Star Wars, you know, creating his own fantasy world, his own sandbox to play in. And what he gave me was one really great character, one really likable character and one very forgettable character. The problem is the forgettable one is probably the lead protagonist of your series. And that really let me down. I love the magic system. I love kind of the, the crooked church kind of vibes that we're getting out of here. Uh, I really like the, the monsters. They were pretty cool. But it was very predictable. Obviously, a lot of traditional fantasy in the 90s was pretty predictable. But it's, uh, I don't know. One of the one of the highlights of the book, you kind of he kind of uh, let's just say uh, they aren't going to be showing their faces again the rest of the series, and uh, the character that I was the least interested in looks like it's going to be the lead character the rest of the way, and I'm just like, uh. so just like with Silo or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Wool is where I'm saying I like the book enough to continue with the series. I've got six more of them on my shelf, just not very very excited to do it like I was when I started book number one. So uh, I, I think Salvatore's a good enough writer that I could probably finish the series and not regret it, but I am way, way, way less excited now than I was when I picked up the Demon Awakens. So Demon Wars is one of those, it's one of those that it's, people have said, yeah, it's nothing that's reinventing the wheel. It's traditional fantasy. You've heard a lot of these things before, but it's still a really good time. And I'd agree with that. I feel like uh, Brandon Sanders and fans would probably like it quite a bit because of the way that you have the three characters and then you have the magic system as well. I feel like that's kind of set up in a way that Brandon Sanders and fans will probably really, really enjoy it. But for me, yeah, I'd be lying if I said it was not a disappointment. Even if I didn't think it was a bad book, my expectations were pretty, pretty high for it. Uh, so how about some channel growth? This is the depressing part of the video. I'm going to go through it quick since it's not good. Uh, it's the worst engagement, guys, I've had since 2021. I know the channel did get hacked and that hurt some things. I talked about that recently, so I won't regurgitate it here. But yeah, numbers are, are pretty weak. And it's, it's weird because everything's still kind of the same except engagement and view. Uh, 11.6 thousand new subs. That's up 1.8 thousand over 2023 during the same time period. Uh, 2.6 million views. That's up 0.2 million over the same time in 2023. So you think, okay, this looks fine. This is not, you know, a little bit of tiny growth. Not a big deal. And then you get to hear uh, 342,000 hours watched, guys. That's down 177,000 over 20. 23 during the same time period. So yeah, that's a big dagger. I'm getting people to still subscribe. I'm getting people uh, to still uh, view a little bit. They're just not watching very long and they're not really clicking or they're not staying very long. So it's uh, it's one of those things I got to try to figure out what's going on. I, I don't want to blame this all on the channel getting hacked because these numbers were kind of similar before that happened. But yeah, ever since then, it's really, I mean, it's been hard 
to kind of recover from it. So we'll look at this when the year does end, and then I will I will cry into a river. Then let's look at some of the most popular content so far this year. Uh, top 10 sci-fi books, uh, 121,000 views is a video I wasn't sure anybody was really interested in, but I did have several people saying, you know, hey, why don't you've done your favorite fantasy series? Why don't you do your favorite sci-fi series? I haven't read enough series. You know, I am mostly a fantasy channel, but I've read enough sci-fi books, and that's what I did make there. And uh, top 10 fantasy series as of 2024. That's the one that I update every single year. 101,000 views. So yeah, guys, top 10, still very popular. What surprises me, guys, is I have two book reviews on here, which is weird because book reviews are my least watched content on the channel, except for Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett, just the standard book review for that. 43,000 views, but you know what? I got like 42,000 that first week, and then it just went... So again, the algorithm is very weird. Uh, also, if you look at the algorithm for that, or the, I'm sorry, the, the analytics for that, uh, yeah, it, it, people watch it for like two minutes. So I don't know what happened there because I had the other one that did that. And that was the long walk that had 37,000 views. That's actually my fifth most popular video for the year. And uh, long walk's amazing. I don't really know what else to say about it. And 41,000 views, no, not all of the Dune sequels suck. That was just, you know, around the time that the new movie came out i had a lot of people going back to my old doom videos and being like yeah it's great it's too bad that all the sequels suck and i started being like i don't they are like doom but i don't think that they suck so i just want to kind of make a video where i stood on it that i think that uh, dune one through four are a great story as long as you go to it knowing these things you know so uh again anytime i can try to get more people to read the works of frank herbert i am doing uh, my, my job. That's that's what I do here. I, I try to get more people to read Frank Herbert, one of my favorite authors ever. And uh, yeah, it's, if I can put a positive spin on some of those things. But I, again, I, I did warn some people off when they first got there. If you're here thinking I'm going to talk great about the Brian Herbert books, you are wrong. That is not this video. I'm talking about the works of Frank Herbert. Because you're talking about the works of Brian Herbert? Yeah, all the Dune sequels suck. <laughs> uh, goals for the second half of 2024 look to see if i can figure out how to get back in the good graces of the algorithm uh like i said ever since the channel hack everything's down all of my views are down all of my watch time is down and i'm trying to figure out how to get back in their good graces it's really there's no magic bullet there just got to keep on keeping on and hope that being consistent can't get me back in their good graces. Uh, just continue to mix it up with the genres. That's something that I feel like I'm doing right now because it's helped me avoid burnout. You know, I'm doing one fantasy, one sci-fi, one horror, one miscellaneous, and one manga every single month. Now, I feel like that's a great format for me and because uh, I did get burned out a little bit earlier in the year just doing fantasy, 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 fantasy. I feel like you can get burned out with that a little bit if you don't change it up once in a while. And this forces me to change it up and forces me to read more horror, not just in October, and more sci-fi, which I always seem to just kind of skip to the next month. Uh, just continue to try to new things. I mean, uh, while the algorithms uh, hurt me right now, uh, I think it's a good time to try new things to see what works and what doesn't. That's going to be collaborations. There's going to be other things, maybe some kinds of new uh, ideas that I have or new uh, new segments i could do to try some new things but yeah it's a it's always a learning experience with this guys there is no there is no made men or women i think when it comes to youtube you've always got to stay vigilant and adapt or perish that's definitely the way to go here and i'm going to keep trying to do that as we roll through year number five here on the channel so guys what has been your best read so far in 2024 what has been your most disappointing I would love to hear these below. Unless, of course, it's like Jonathan Cohen who said that It was his most disappointing book that he's read this year. But uh, I don't mean to put him on a, a, a an island here. It's just I'm having a hard time dealing with it. I would love to know you guys' uh, favorite and least favorite book that you've read so far in 2024. As always, guys, there are no wrong answers. So drop down there and let me know, and I will talk to you there.